Very diversified. A, a huge economic engine in the region. Uh, very cosmopolitan. And it was there that Paul rolls in, a good Jewish young man rolls into a very foreign pagan city, and he finds 12 dudes, 12 guys who really, honestly, they didn't have very good theology. Their theology was a little jacked up. But Paul comes in, and he, and he says, okay, you're a little adrift in your theology, but let me clear it up for you. The person that you want to follow, his name is Jesus. And Paul literally laid his hands on them, and uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them in that moment, and then crazy stuff starts happening. These guys start speaking in languages they have never understood. I wonder if they even signed, uh, perhaps. I've never thought about that before. These guys are starting to dream visions, and, and, and uh, just amazing stuff starting to happen, and it's all happening in the church. It's happening in the synagogue. But of course, the synagogue officials They've seen the movie Contagion, and they know what crazy looks like. They know what a viral outbreak of the flu looks like, and they try to snuff it out, and they kick out Paul and his uh, friends after about three months. And so what does Paul do? He goes to the most secular, pagan place. He goes to a place called the Hall of Tyrannus. And it's there that he, every day, does his best Seth Godin, or his best Josh McDowell, and he persuades and he argues for the good news of Jesus such that the whole region in the area has now heard about the forgiveness and the tenderness of Jesus and it's the coolest thing ever and then more crazy happens. I mean Luke, the author of Acts, he actually describes that not only did miracles happen but extraordinary miracles happen. Now I don't know about you but I, just a miracle is good enough for me. If it's a miracle then that's good. But Paul, uh, uh, Luke actually goes on to say it was an extraordinary miracle, as if there are normal miracles and then there are extraordinary miracles. Things like just touching a handkerchief that Paul had touched, just touching an apron that had grazed Paul, and people are getting healed, and demons are being casted out, and there's just a ton of kind of Holy Spirit mojo going on, such that others are beginning to take notice. Others who don't know Jesus, don't believe in Jesus, but they want to use the power of Jesus for their, for their purposes. So there are seven kids. They were PKs. They were pastor's kids. And they decided that in their uh, work, which they were, the, their job was to cast out demons. But again, they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't follow Jesus, but they wanted to use the power of Jesus. So they began to invoke Jesus' name in casting out demons in people's lives, uh, presumably around the synagogue. And it appears that goes well for a while until one such demon turns to these seven sons of Siva, were, were their names, and says the following, I know Jesus, and I've heard of Paul, but who the heck are you? And that's when this demon turns on these seven sons of Siva, does his best Chuck Norris, does a MMA move like you wouldn't have ever seen on cable television and drives them out naked and bleeding out of the house. Now, you'd think this would be kind of a, a great tactical move on the demon's part. It wasn't because what it did in the city of Ephesus is it gave Paul even greater street credibility. And fear began, a good kind of fear, began to take hold and seize the people of Ephesus such that they began to see that this pagan God they had been serving and, and these spiritual strongholds were not the most powerful being in town. So they went into their treasure chests, they went into their closets, and they grabbed their sorcery scrolls. They grabbed all their like dungeon and dragon games from the 1980s, and they brought them out in the city streets and they began to set them on fire. Literally, there's a huge bonfire in the street of Ephesus, and one by one, people would bring all their magic and pour it into the pyre, and it would go up in smoke. The scriptures say 50,000 drachmas were burned in that one day, which by my estimates would have, uh, equate to about $3 million in today's currency. This is what we call a movement. People's hearts are being moved. Life is being changed. People are being freed from bondage and from their old ways. And literally, 
It's going up in smoke, and they're being liberated in the person of Jesus, and it's awesome, and yet it's also threatening. So there's a guy named Demetrius. He's a silversmith in town. What does he do for his job? He makes little uh, silver, silver figurines of the local god of Ephesus, whose name was Artemis. Artemis was called the Lioness of the Hunt. They had a temple um, in Ephesus dedicated to Artemis. It was called the Temple of Artemis. It still today is one of the seven wonders of the world. And Demetrius and his cronies, they did quite a killing. They supported the temple with all the silver needed, and they sold these little pagan dolls of Artemis, these little silver figurines. But guess what? Because of the movement of Jesus, people aren't buying it anymore. Because the Apostle Paul is going around saying, hey, you can just buy these on the Home Shopping Network, and they're going to end up in your garage sale just two years from now, so don't waste your money. And they begin to see their profit margins decrease, such that Demetrius says, you know what? We've got a problem on our hands. And so he calls all the different silversmiths together, and those in the related trades, and says, we've got to snuff this guy Paul and this Jesus movement out. And so they start kind of doing some rebel rouse. And they start kind of spreading some gossip such that they get the whole town of Ephesus so riled up that like a swarm of locusts or bees or a hornet's nest, they stir that thing such that people come out of their homes, converge in the city street, and pick up Paul's friends and carry them to the local palladium or Colosseum. Now you can see here, this is the, the archaeological remains of the Colosseum. Could you just imagine being grabbed, carried by a throng, you're now in the middle of a riot. And this is, you know, kind of like a Justin Bieber concert, but these are not little girls and they're not crying. You know, this is, this is like a flash mob, but they're not there to dance. They more than likely have huge stones in their hand and they're prepared to tear you limb for limb as they're chanting, great is Artemis. The God of Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul is standing outside. He hasn't been seized or captured, but he sees all of this going down. And here's the part I love. He's chomping at the bit to say, let me in there. Let me go in there and make claims for the person of Jesus. And they're literally our friends saying, Paul, don't do that. They will eat you for lunch. And by a stroke of great leadership, a city clerk of Ephesus comes in quiets the crowd, creates order, and kind of snuffs out the riot. But as I read Acts chapter 19, I began to wonder, why does that not happen here? You read Acts, and actually this was somewhat of a pattern for Paul, just two chapters before in Acts chapter 17, he rolls into a town called Thessalonica. What happens? A riot occurs. What would it take to cause a riot here in our city, in Kansas City. Now, notice, notice like what caused the riot. It wasn't Christian protests and boycotts and singing camp songs and wearing Christian t-shirts. It may not be bad, it's just not what caused the riot. What caused the riot? Life change. People having their hearts transformed. The fruit of people coming to Jesus and being set free. That was, the, that was what caused the riot, and it became a threat. Now think about who did the rioting. It wasn't Christ followers. It was non-believers. Because this transformation, this growth, became a threat to them. And all they need, knew to do in defense of this beautiful thing, this beautiful uprising, was to create a riot in return. And there's a truth about people, and there's a truth about culture, and it's this. That in our sickness, we will defend that which makes us sick. Think about that. In our sickness, we will defend that which makes us sick. There's an irony there. That's what was happening in, in Ephesus. Think about what it meant at that day and age to be subservient to a pagan god. What do we know about Artemis? Artemis was, again, I've said 
the, um, the, the lioness of the hunt. She was a fertility god. At Artemis' temple, there were little girls half-dressed that were the attendants of the court. And you can imagine how they were used. You can imagine how they were betrayed and abused. You can imagine all the different ways in which people were held in bondage to this fake and pagan God. And what are they chanting when Paul comes to bring this beautiful message of grace, of freedom, of liberation? They're chanting, great is Artemis, the God of our city. There's irony there. That finally a message of freedom and to be set free. And they're going to defend that which makes them sick. There's a truth there, I think, for all of us, personally. Is that if we examine our own lives, we will defend most fiercely those things that can make us sick. And it's really confusing. You look at Ephesus, and you can see that they thought light was dark, and dark was light. They thought up was down, and down was up. They literally did. And, and you can see it here in, in one of the verses that... Uh, here's what Demetrius is saying about Paul. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. Paul's bringing truth. And what are they calling it? Heresy. They have it completely backwards. And then I love this next little line. As the riot is starting to take shape, it says this. That the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. And I think there's some truth about that in our culture. I think we equate all too often truth with popular opinion in our culture. And we are subservient ourselves in much the same way. I don't know if you've seen this. In, in modern day terms, but I was in Guatemala. I've been there a couple of times. And um, I went to this little town up in the mountains called Chichi Castaneda. And it was there, you know, that I was doing some touring and buying some little, you know, trinkets and things to bring home. But then we had an opportunity to climb this mountain by switchback up to meet the god of the city whose name was Pascualaba. And much like Ephesus, uh, the, if, if you go today to the temple of, of Artemis, the, it was generally, a, we, it's believed, a, a meteor that fell. And the local people said, well, that could only be from a god, so let's call it Artemis. Same here. There was a stone hinge. There was a rock that looked kind of like the etching of a face. They gave it a name, Squalipa, and this was the god of their city. And people, in reference to this rock, would climb this mountain on their knees, switch back to switch back. They would bring offerings of their grain and of their corn and of their money, and they would lay it in the circle of ashes around this wall. There was a little girl on one such occasion, probably 12 years of age, selling a Pasqualba figurine could have been made by someone named Demetrius. And on one occasion, we were there, and we just decided, this God, this power, has this city in bondage. And so we decided to form a circle around this altar. We held hands, and we prayed in the name of Jesus, that by the power of Jesus, this city would be set free. Now, you don't know me, and I don't know you, so what I'm about to tell you, you might just want to kind of file away going, I'm not sure what to think about that. That's okay, because that's exactly what I did. But in that moment as we prayed, an elderly woman who was having a picnic beside the altar stood up and said, I have a message for you from this wall. And she went into the center of the altar, and she began to do a dance, she began to fall into a weird trance as if something was taking over her body. And she began to speak with a voice that did not sound like the voice of an elderly woman. And she said, do not form a circle around my altar. This is all being translated to me later because I didn't understand their language. 
and our translator would respond back uh, forthrightly. And the only word that I knew in that language was Jesu Cristo, because they spoke Spanish. But what I do remember is every time the name of Jesus, every time I heard the words Jesu Cristo, the woman would viscerally, almost violently respond in English and torment me. Much like maybe some of those that were casted out back in Acts chapter 19 in the city of Ephesus. And I'll just never forget that here was a woman defending that which makes her sick. And we do the same thing. But the good news is that when the gospel of Jesus is rightly lived, it will always confront the power structures of its day. That when the gospel of Jesus comes and is embodied in people like you and me, when it is lived in its full totality, it will come and it will set people free and it will confront the power structures of its day. What, did that, what was that in Ephesus? Well, it was confronting the commerce of the city for the local silversmiths. And you can read here that this is what um, the conversation they had. If we go to the next slide here, Sharon. That Demetrius called them together along with the workers and related trades and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. Like, this was a cash cow. And the gospel is coming and it's cheating their profits. Now, am I for uh, the marketplace and all those things? Absolutely. And I'm for Christ followers following Jesus in the marketplace. But the power structure in that day was commerce. It was also religion. Where did they get first get kicked out of? It was the synagogue. So there was something really threatening within the religious structures of their day. And lastly, there was the spiritual stronghold of a pagan God, of an enemy that wanted to keep these people in trap. But when the gospel came in, it began to set people free such that they were willing to burn that which was most precious to them just the day before. Their sorcery scrolls. They came and they threw them on the fire. And it makes me wonder, what today would you love to see thrown into the fire in our city? What today in our city would you love to see thrown into the bonfire and burned up in smoke? I can think of a few things. You maybe know this, but one of the primary hubs up in our nation for human and sex trafficking. Do you know where it, where it is? 435 in Mecca. 435 in Mecca. A primary hub in our nation. Right in the heart of Oregon Park. Do you know that in our city, there are more payday loan type stores which is, you may or may not know, just break the backs of the poor with their exorbitant interest rates and the like, and their compounding interest. There are more of those in our city than there are McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King's combined. I'd love to see that flow on the farm. There is a history in our city of racism. There is great separation between African Americans, whites, and all kinds of different minorities. We live in a very populated city, and if there were one street that divided us most cleanly, if you looked at a map, at racial demographics, it would be what's called the truce pool. And there's great history behind that, in terms of when our country club plaza was designed, when many of our neighborhoods, like Prairie Village and places like that were created, they installed racially restricted covenants that said, unless you're white, you can't move in here. White flight began when real estate developers began knocking door to door and said, you better sell now because, quote unquote, they are coming. And that's where we get the term white flight. 
Poverty in our city has more than doubled in the last decade. I mean, these are just a few. And here's the cruel thing, church. I'm sitting here listening uh, to your children's uh, a sermon. I'm hearing all of the announcements, and I know that this is in your heart. I know that you are a people who are locking arms with others, saying, well, this is not going to happen on our watch. Tornadoes. We're going to respond. We're going to do a car wash to be a part of serving our city. We're, we're going to continue this to do mission trips. I mean, this is just awesome to sit here and to know that you have a heart to say, we want to be a part of some of those dragons and some of those things going up in smoke. Because that's what happens when the gospel is regularly lived. And so, if we were just to step back for a moment and say, what did Paul do? He did a lot, but just to keep my sermon a little shorter than it could be. The first thing is he went. He went to Ephesus. Just like you guys are doing. And let me be really clear. You don't have to, like, go somewhere. I think it's more of a posture in our heart. We've actually all been placed somewhere. We all have an Ephesus right now that God, has, like there's a reason God has placed you where you are, your neighborhood, your place of work, your community. And the question in our hearts is, will I go there seeking to cooperate with the ways God wants to advance his kingdom right here in my midst and around me? Will I go with a heart that says, Lord, I just want to cooperate with your movement today, give me the eyes to see it, and give me the ability to recognize it. So Paul went. And my encouragement for you is, will you do it? And as you do it, here's the cool thing about Ephesus. It was one church. And it's so awesome when you read the book of Acts, it doesn't say, and then there's the first Baptist church of Ephesus, and then there's the second Presbyterian church of Ephesus, and then there was the third removed, you know, church of Ephesus or whatever. It was just the church of Ephesus. And they met sometimes all together, and they met sometimes in little tiny uh, clusters. And you see it here, that they met in um, public places and also in house to house. So here's what um, Paul writes in Acts 20. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. And when I think about how God views us, I love the local church. I love the local church and all of its expressions, and nuances, and styles. We worship very differently than you all do at, at Heartland. We have different distinctives, and you have different ones from us. But I think when Jesus looks over Kansas City, and when he observes us doing simple things like what we're doing today, for all of our blemishes, for all the things that we want to grow in, I think he smiles today and says, that's my church. That's the church of Kansas City. And will they be a light on the hill? And will they be salt of the earth as they learn to love one another? As they learn to be as one as the Father and the Son are one, as Jesus prayed that his church would be. And will they be postured such that they will seek the transformation of the city? together. And that's what I love about the privilege of being with you. And that's why I want to call you Deaf International Community Church to join us on the What If the Church weekend. It's, it, you could say, it's practice for what I hope to be a lifelong endeavor of starting a riot in our city. So I want to ask you, would you come Friday night, June the 7th to Westside Family Church and Pastor Debbie and Pastor Jacob, they've explained to me that Christian worship events uh, aren't always a great experience for you all, and I totally get that. But for the larger call, for living out of the vision of Revelation 7 that we'll all be holding palm branches together before the King, Pastor Debbie and Jacob, they'll be participating in the service, and we would just love for you and for us to lock arms together on that night. And then on the following day, I know there's a car wash. I know there's all sorts of things going on. And I just want to encourage you, would you give up your time, pour out your hearts, 
and serve with us. And sign up today to do that. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you today. Let me close us in prayer. God, we are grateful that your heart is for the transformation of our hearts. And your heart is to restore all things that you have created. And I thank you that you have chosen us to be a part of that work. So I just ask for your grace and I ask for our faithfulness to converge for something truly beautiful. That our world might step back and say, this isn't what I expected the church to be.